first one is the cosmological question, where did all this come from? That's a question that Islam deals with. Where did all this come from? These are the five big questions. There's a lot of little questions in the world and a lot of people spend their lives in those little questions and they never get to the big ones. But the big ones are always confronting them and there's only five basic ones, that's it. And if you learn those five and occupy your life with those five, then you've done yourself uh, a service because they're really the only ones of worth or weight. So the first one is that cosmological question, where did this come from? And the Quran gives an answer. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will respond, Allah. So all of this, we believe, came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a question of ultimate concern. Where did this come from? The next question is what they call the eschatological question, which is how do we know anything? Right? In other words, how, what is knowledge and how is knowledge obtained? And the Qur'an answers that question again in the beginning of the Qur'an. اِقْرَ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَرَقْ Read in the name of your Lord who created خَرَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَرَقْ اِقْرَ وَرَبُّكَ رَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَهُ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Allah is the one that taught the human being. And he also said, How do we know things? We know things through language. The difference between the human and other creatures is that humans know language. We know things through direct intuition, which is called baruri, right? And then we know things through discursive thought, which is called nadari. In other words, the ability uh, to reflect on things. So things that we know intuitively is that this is greater than this. Even a child knows that. How do we know that? We don't really, that's a difficult one to get to of why we know that type of knowledge. But the fact that we know it, it's intuitive. So there are things we know intuitively and then there are things we learn. We have to learn. Now one of the other things, this divides into two types of knowledge again, which is revelation and then uh, inspired knowledge. Revelation is what prophets are given that we do not have access to except a small portion which is 146 there's different hadith about that but 146 of prophecy is a true dream which every human being including uh, uh, irrespective of religion or anything every human being has access to that and one of the reasons for that is to let people know the nature of revelation so you can have a dream that actually comes true and many, many people have had this. There, there, there's books written on this subject, clairvoyant dreams. So that is a portion of prophecy that only indicates the nature of prophecy, that it is the ability to know something that you have no material means to know it. Right? It's neither intuitive nor is it discursive. You can't learn it, you can't acquire it, nor do you know it intuitively. It's given. It's a knowledge that is given, and that is given to the prophets. So that is the question of how we know things. And then you have the ontological question, which is, who am I? Who am I? I mean, that's a question. Who am I? And the Quran answers that question, who you are. The Quran answers it by telling you that you are a slave of Allah. You're, you're abd, right? You are a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is who you are. And the Quran also tells you that you're dependent. Because a lot of people, even though it's as obvious as the sun on a midday morning, many people are actually not aware that they are dependent creatures. It's, it's a fascinating delusion that many human beings actually have. They are not aware that they're dependent. And so who you are is you are in time, in space, right? You're an in time and in space creature, so you're dependent on time space. And then you're, you're a biological creature, which means you have the five biological functions, uh, one of them being ingestion and the other excretion, right? So you ingest and you have to excrete so that there, you're dependent on food, you're dependent on the processing of food, and then on the elimination of what is separated from that food. So all those are in, indicative of your state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are faqir, you're abd. 
So you're a servant and you're dependent. The nature of servitude is dependence, right? Because the servant is dependent on the master. So that, that is who you are. And then the next question is what they call the satoriological question, which is, what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? And that question again is answered in the Quran. There are three reasons for your existence according to the Quran. The Quran says that He created you from the world, from the earth, min al ard, wustamarakum fiha, right? And then He placed you in the earth in order for imara. Imara is to cultivate. Umran is cultivation or civilization. The the imara is the opposite of if said. So, for instance, if you go to Las Vegas. In Arabic, you can say Amaruha, you know, they cultivate it. But in reality, the Quranic perspective, Las Vegas is not Imara. It's not cultivating. It's doing the opposite. Because the thing is, the Arabs say, you know, whoever cultivates thorns will not harvest grapes. Right? The purpose of cultivation, because it comes from an agricultural metaphor, is something that's going to benefit you. And that is why tobacco cultivation is not imara. Nor is the cultivation of grapes for wine imara. But if you were cultivating grapes for food, it is imara. So when you look at this idea of cultivation, you have to look at what is the aim that the action is derived from. And if the aim is an aim that serves the best interests of humanity, that is imara. If it serves the worst, if it serves in any way to harm the human being, then it's not imara. So Allah created you for imara, which is to cultivate the earth for beneficial purposes. That includes agriculture, engineering, medicine, a building of schools, a building of orphanages. All of these things is imara, setting up political structures. Everything that will benefit the human being is imara. And that is preceded, according to the Quran, by ithara, which is actually to take from the earth what you need to do that. So you have the, the, the aims and objectives, right? Uh, and you have the means to do that. The means are taken from ithara, and the aims and objectives will indicate whether or not it's cultivation or not. So that, that is a, a big question. Why are you here? Imara. The second reason is istikhlaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He has يَسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلْيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ تَعْمَنُونَ That He has made you khulafa in the earth and then He watches how you behave, what you do. So the idea of khilafa, and this has two elements. One of them is the idea that you are here for perpetuity. In other words, the, the, the people that were here before you were here in order for you to come next. So that, that's an aspect of, of the istikhlaf, that those people that were here before you, they were here in order for you to come here. That's one of their reasons for being, for existing, so that you can exist. So each generation is a link in the previous generation and for the following generation. So you are a link, and that link is the link of istikhlaf. So from one end, you are the khalaf of these people, and from another end, you're the salaf. You're leaving behind khalaf. All right? So that is one of the reasons why Allah placed us in the earth, for this linkage. That's one aspect of khilafah. The second aspect is what, once you realize you're a link, what does that necessitate in your perspective? Responsibility. In other words, not only do you have a responsibility for those that went before you to sustain what they left behind for you. Because think about this, if each generation had to start over and build political institutions, build uh, roads, build infrastructure, you would spend your entire life engaged in that project. But you don't have to do that because it was already done for you. So you have a gratitude for the people that went before you. And you feel a responsibility for those who come after you. And that is khilafa. It's a responsibility that you have to maintain the earth. 
And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تفسد الأرض بعد إصلاحها Don't corrupt the earth after it was rectified for you. It was rectified for you by Allah initially by creating this extraordinary globe that has a perfect admixture of gases that enable us to survive, that is a perfect distance from the sun that enables everything on the earth to survive, that has this extraordinary 23.5 degree tilt so that you have four seasons that enable uh, life to exist. He set up all of these things and then he gave you all this extraordinary, the canopy above you in order to orient yourself, in order to guide yourself uh, in your travels. He created the earth of firash according to the Quran, which is like a bed. It's neither hard, not, neither too hard nor too soft. In other words, it's in between the two. So you can dig the earth, but the earth is not like sand so that you can't benefit from it. So you can build foundations that will actually last. Because if this was pure marble, you couldn't set up a house on marble. It would be almost impossible. So all of this he did and then said, don't mess it up. That, if that's been now there's another aspect of that is that the previous generation did all of this work. Don't destroy what they did. You can rectify things because every generation is going to do some things right and some things wrong. So you can rectify what they might have done wrong, but don't think it's all wrong. It's not. I mean, no country that has any type of uh, infrastructure is all wrong. It doesn't matter what country it is. And what happens is now you look at a place like Afghanistan, where the infrastructure is completely destroyed, and look at the state of the people. And don't think you can just take one government out and fill it with another government with any ease. I mean, these are really difficult situations. So the point is, is that if, if you've got a situation, it might not be the best of all possible wars. It wasn't meant to be the best because that's the nature of being on the earth. But don't think that you can just easily create a revolution and you're going to set things right. Because it took a great deal of time and effort to set up what exists. And so changing that is transformative instead of revolutionary, right? Transformation is better change than revolutionary change because revolutionary change disrupts. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ did not disrupt the existing social order. If you look at his seerah, he did not disrupt the existing social order. I mean, even when he went into Mecca, he still made Abu Sufyan the Sayyid of his people. Man dakhala bayta Abi Sufyan fahuwa amin. He made him the say. He didn't say, okay, now, why? Because in the muluk, إِذَا دَخْرُوا قَرَيَةً جَعَلُوا أَعِزَّةَ أَهْلِهَا أَذِلَّهُ It's kings that when they come into cities, they turn it all upside down. Right? Conquering kings are the ones that disrupt everything, not prophets. Prophets just, they rectify. They put it in perspective. So the idea of why we're here is istikhlaf. That's one of the main uh, reasons this idea of not only that you are a link but also that as a link you have to maintain the link of the past by not severing that and throwing off the past which is the mistakes of modernity one of the big mistakes of modernity is severing the link of the past and believing that what we have today is better than anything that went before us and the mistake the other mistake is severing the link of the future by not protecting what you've been given as a sacred trust, the biosphere, the animal kingdom, uh, the genetic pool. I mean, these are all sacred trusts that you've been given. Don't muck this up because it took a great deal of effort uh, to get where it is. Uh, not on Allah's part, it took no effort whatsoever, but even through His Sunan it did because Allah's Sunan is eons of work. I mean, the universe took eons to get to where it is. So that, that is the question of, the third uh, is for ibadah, which is worship. Now, the thing about ibadah is that ibadah permeates all three purposes. Imara, which is cultivation, istikhlaf, which is perpetuity and responsibility, and then ibadah. And the ibadah has two aspects. The first is the ibadah that involves your own self, and then the second is the ibadah that involves others. All right. So in, in relation to the ibadah that involves yourself, that is learning 
the fara'il and the mandubat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to do. And there's a reason for doing that. He did not give this to you لِيَجْعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ حَرَجْ He didn't do this in order to make things hard for you وَلَكِنْ لِيُطَهِرُكُمْ But in order for tahara, to purify you. So the whole purpose of everything that Allah has given us is not to make it difficult. It's not for haraj. Don't think that it's for difficulty that He told you to get up for fajr, that He told you to pray. No, this is to purify you, to set you straight. Because you have an obligation to be upright because of the past and because of the future. You have an obligation of Khalifa. And in order to be Khalifa, in order to be a Caliph, a vice regent, you have to be up for the challenge. If you're not up for the challenge, you can't do it. Because if those before you were straight, then you are like their shadow and you'll be straight. Right? And if those who come after you, right, if you're straight, then you're like their shadow. Right. But if the, shadow, if, the, if the object is crooked, then the shadow by necessity is crooked because what follows, do you see, that's what happens. So with the child, if you're crooked, the child is going to be crooked, right. with rare exception. And that's why you have an obligation because children, you cannot say to children, do as I say, but don't do as I do. It doesn't work. So... The idea of ibad is to know what you've been told to know and then to the mu'amadat, how you deal with others. Because there is a haqq of Allah in your dealings with yourself and with others. This is the haqq of Allah. Now, the whole point of this is siyasa. And siyasa is, I mean, it's translated in modern Arabic as politics. But it's not... It's a, it's a bad translation, even though that is the equivalent word in English. Siyasa is a much deeper word. Because siyasa comes from a word which is to train a horse. Right? And if you watch a horse trained, it's, a, it's an amazing process to take a wild horse and train. And there's two ways to do it. You can do it with violence, which is the way it's usually done. And you can do it with gentleness. It's a complete two different methods of training horses. And uh, I, I know this experientially because my grandfather was a horse trainer. Uh, he kept horses as a hobby. And, uh, and I remember watching him do the gentle whip, just getting it used to going around in circles. And then when he saddled it, just slowly first, just putting the saddle on, not riding it, just getting it used to the idea of a saddle. Very slow process. And that is the siyasa of the self. Because the self is like a horse. And then the, there's the siyasa with others. And this is absolutely essential because now we're moving into the musabra. The final question, that's the big one, right? Is the eschatological question, fa'ayna tadhabun? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where, where's all this lead? What's all this leading to? Because we're all going to die. At this stage in life, you should have realized that by now that you're a temporal creature and you're going to die. And that is a big question, is the eschatological question. Does it end with death or does it go on? And if it goes on, what goes on? And are we responsible? There's a lot of questions involved in that. So that's the question of ma'ad. And that's the question of the Qur'an, fa'ayna tadhabun. And Allah answers the question, inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'un. You're returning to Allah. Yab'athakum, He raises you up. Right? Yuhasibukum, He'll take you into account take yourself to account before you're taken to account right? don't wait till the tax people come you should have an accountant doing all that stuff to make sure it's alright because if you wait until the tax man comes and you've done no accounting it's off to jail